So, uh, in beginning here, I want to thank you for your invitation. Um, I want to thank you for being here. This is incredible. And I want to thank especially those who may have come from Washington or from the Miami field office of the Homeland Security folks or FBI <laughs> or the CIA. Would you identify yourselves, please? <laughs> they never do. We welcome all members. <laughs> Well, that's good. I like that. Uh, I want to uh, mention uh, that uh, we were a little downcast in Washington when we saw George Bush go into the sunset because he had that direct link with the Almighty. Do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> and he downlinked it and took it off to Dallas with him. Not even Cheney has that link anymore. But some friends of mine from NSA have figured out how to reestablish that link, and we have some fresh information, an apocryphal story about what happened really to Osama bin Laden. Would you like to hear? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, uh, there was a mullah with that Navy SEALs team. Yeah, uh, there was. And a mullah, you know, like a priest yeah. or a rabbi, okay? And he gave Osama bin Laden two minutes to make a confession, a clean breast of things, put himself right with the Almighty, and when he got up there, St. Peter was closing up shop, it was a Friday afternoon, okay? <laughs> and <clears throat> he's looking down at the, and there's this very, very tall guy with a white, you know, big white dress, you know, and St. Peter says, my God, that looks like, that looks like Osama. So St. Peter goes by the book, right? So he went to his book and he said, oh, sure, there was a late entry. Osama bin Laden has confessed, he's been forgiven, welcome him with open arms into heaven. So St. Peter says, Whew, I'm glad I saw Osama bin Laden's right up there. He says, uh, uh, Osama bin Laden? <laughs> Which translated from the Arabic is, who do you think I am? Okay. He says, well, you're most welcome. Come on in here. Uh, I'd like to meet some folks. And they go through a little alcove there and, ah, oh, you're in luck. There's George Washington over there. Thomas Jefferson? Ah, oh, James Madison and, and Monroe. Osama bin Laden. <laughs> Translated from the Arabic, where are my virgins? <laughs> <laughs> and St. Peter says, oh, you didn't get that garble. It wasn't virgins, it was Virginians. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm supposed to be talking about whether the CIA <coughs> has become rogue. Well, the, the story about the CIA is not all that complicated. Uh, the CIA is a function of Pearl Harbor. And many of you know that before Pearl Harbor, there were little snippets of information among the code breakers the Army Air Corps at the time, the embassy in Tokyo, the Japanese embassy in Washington, and, and the, the Navy. And we had, if there were one person, like one central, okay, one central point where all that information was put together, it would have been a no-brainer. No-brainer. Where is that Japanese fleet, okay? There was no central place. So Harry Truman was hell-bent and determined that would never happen again, okay? That's why he conceived of and created the Central Intelligence Agency. He wanted one place where, and it happened. You know, that's why I was attracted, you know. <laughs> when John Kennedy was president, I heard what he said, and I mean, this sounds corny these days, but that's why I went down to, to Washington, and that's why a whole bunch of us went down, are still around, okay? We went down there because uh, there was a job to do. And I had majored in Russian at Fordham, so I had something I thought special to offer. And when I heard that into this inbox, <clears throat> now I don't have to explain inboxes to you, but when I speak at university audience, I have to say, you know, you won't believe this, but our inboxes used to be made out of wood, okay? <laughs> there would be an inbox here and an outbox, and we had a you know, piece of paper in and out. And they all go, where's this guy? You know, <laughs> how long has this guy been from Mars, you know? But into my inbox came all manner of information, okay? from intercepted messages, from overhead photography, from defector reports, from our own spies, from embassy, from the FBI, from, from NSA, from, you know, it all came in there. And my, my account was, 
watching Soviet foreign policy toward China and the Far East, including Vietnam. This is the early 60s, okay, and then the mid 60s. And it was just very, very invigorating to find out that what they promised me was true. And not only that, but the second reason that Truman set up the CIA also turned out to be true. We were, he wanted one place. He wanted one person to go to, the director of the CIA. He wanted to be able to say, look, Mr. Director, come on down here to the White House. I want to hear what you and those two universities worth of specialists out there in the woods of Virginia, what you really think about this. Example, <clears throat> here's LBJ trying to figure out what to do about Vietnam, right? <coughs> and these blue suit, now I'm a little prejudiced, I'm an infantry officer, okay? These blue suited guys, <coughs> blue suited guys here uh, are telling me, says LBJ, that they have this, these great new planes, B-52s, right? <coughs> And they have these great big bombs, and they're going to seal off the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, Ho Chi Minh's going to give up, and we're going to win the war. What do you guys think? <laughs> well, you know, we waited a, a decent interval. We knew what the answer was. A couple of my friends working next to me had brought Ho Chi Minh into Hanoi at the end of the war on their shoulders. They knew what kind of guy he was. They knew what a nationalist movement was, how they expelled the Chinese and the French and the Japanese, you know. They knew Ho Chi Minh's not gonna give up and especially not giving up under bombing because no one ever has given up under bombing, okay? Or drones or anything like that. You need, again, my infantry officer prejudice here, you need boots on the ground, you need, if you're gonna, okay. So we said to the president, uh, we waited two days and we went back to LBJ and we said, now, Mr. President, number one, um, the Ho Chi Minh Trail doesn't look anything like uh, I-66 or I-75 <laughs> or, or, you know, or I-95. <laughs> it's like 160 trails in, in, and you can't even see it from the, you know, so uh, you, want, you might want to ask the Air Force guys about that. And number two, we know Ho Chi Minh, he's not going to give up. Now, what's part of the lesson here? The president doesn't have to lift, doesn't have to make decisions according to the intelligence. He makes decisions according to politics, politics okay? He didn't want to be the first American president to lose a war, and so he became the first American president <laughs> to lose a war. There's a president in office now who's also going to be blamed for and with some, some justification for losing not one, but two wars. I mean, Iraq was lost from the beginning and so was Afghanistan. But he didn't want to be looked at as weak and so he disregarded the intelligence, yeah. uh, believed the generals who knew they could get extra promotions and, and, and the military industrial complex and could make big bucks on this. And uh, he knew that, that would be the politically smart thing to do and sacrifice the lives of so many of our young and not so young people not to mention the Iraqis and the Afghans, because last time I checked the Bible, they're human beings too. So anyhow, that was the origin of the, F of, of the, of the CIA. And um, it was in 1947 that, uh, that Truman uh, worked out the legislation. It was part of the National Security Act of 1947, which is a great big thing. It created the Department of Defense, the Air Force, you know, it, it, and the National Security Council, it had a whole bunch of things created. The CIA was one part of that national security apparatus. Now, uh, picture yourself, some of you are old enough. Uh, I was, I remember, I was born one week before Hitler drove his tanks into Poland to start World War II. And um, I remember the, the, the atmosphere after World War II, you know, uh, we had uh, some problems with the Russians, right? They had taken it on the chin, lost 30 million people. 30 million people in that war, okay? We had lost, well, we had lost a lot of our men, but nobody at home, okay? But the Russians are coming into Eastern Europe and so forth, okay? So, what happens in 1947, Truman gets the legislation written just the way he wants it, there would be one director of central intelligence who would be responsible for all these things I just mentioned and 
for coordinating the other agencies involved in intelligence in our government. Okay, so a two-hatted sort of thing. He was the first among equals and he would coordinate as well as do the job. Now what happened? Well, the covert operators, <coughs> the, uh, the spies, the OSS types, incredibly imaginative, incredibly courageous people also came back from the European uh, and Asian theaters. And uh, they got loud, loud accolades in Washington and then they said, now well, thanks very much, but uh, uh, do, do you still need us? Uh, should we go back to our law firms or corporations, go back to academe, or, or do you need us? Hang around here. Now, visualize, Soviets have already run, e overrun Eastern Europe, they're endangering the Balkans, they're even endangering Italy and France. Question answered itself, of course we need you. And then some idiot, some idiot with no sense of how to manage things, decided, oh, I got an idea. We're creating the CIA. That's going to be secret. And so let's put these, they have to be secret. Let's put these operators, these people who are really good at overthrowing governments, <coughs> we'll put them together with the analysts that, uh, that Harry Truman wanted to tell them the straight scoop on things, okay? Really dumb. That created a structural fault between operations <coughs> and objective intelligence, which has always been an incredible tension, okay? I mean, look at the situation now. <coughs> the head of operations is, is, is running these drones over Pakistan and Somalia and wherever else, you know? Now, how about the analyst who's asked by Congress or asked by the president, are these drones working? Is this a good idea? You know, we'll kill a lot of civilians. You, you think it's still a good idea? How's he going to say, this is a fool's errand. This is outlandish. You're never going to win hearts and minds by killing a bunch of civilians. For everyone you kill, there's an extended family of 50. You know, if you want to make us safe from terrorists, this is the exactly wrong way to do it. Is he going to have the guts to say that? When the head of the CIA is running the drone program, give me a break. It makes it very, very difficult, okay? So that's, that's one of the major points here that we need to, to, uh, to recognize. So this tension exists today as well. Uh, when Petraeus was saying, oh, we're doing just fine in Afghanistan, we're making progress, uh, the estimators, the analysts were saying, hooey, <laughs> there's no progress, uh, this is a fool's errand. And they're still saying that to their credit, okay? Now I guess I have to admit that uh, during the, the regime of George Bush, uh, some, how shall I say it, um, some managers without integrity, let me put it that way, uh, bubbled to the top of the CIA. Uh, one's name was George Tenet, his deputy was John McLaughlin. I know McLaughlin well. Um, and they thought that their job was, if the president wanted to make a war in Iraq, their job was to serve up doctorate intelligence uh, to justify it, okay? Outrageous and completely against the ethos of telling, speaking truth to power or telling like it is, okay? Telling it like it is. And as I watched that, you know, a couple of my colleagues and I established uh, the only alumni organization of intelligence officers that has to do with anything other than making speeches and having cocktails together uh, it was called, we called it, and still in existence, Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity because there wasn't much sanity going on in Washington in those days, okay? Still isn't. So, um, as we watched this and we saw this uh, kind of thing being perverted, uh, we spoke out and, uh, and the estimate, uh, a national intelligence estimate, you must understand, is the most official, most uh, uh, well, it's the premier uh, analytical product, okay? All 16 intelligence agencies com combine to d produce it, and the head of the national intelligence gives it to the president with his signature. What happened in October of 2002, so six or seven months before the attack on Iraq, 
was, was just unconscionable. The, um, well, let, let me just put it this way. After Jay Rockefeller, as head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, got finished with a five-year study of what happened, he revealed explicitly that this wasn't a matter of bad intelligence. It was a matter of fixed intelligence, okay? He said the intelligence adduced to justify the attack on Iraq was unsubstantiated, unconfirmed, and sometimes non-existent. Okay, folks, what's non-existent intelligence? <laughs> Pardon? Lies based on forgeries, right? Couldn't have been worse. And, and, and that was a bipartisan report, okay? Two, two Republicans signed on to that. So that's the history of all this stuff. Now, uh, more recently, and I'll include that here and get a little ahead of myself, um, I had almost given up on my former colleagues in the analysis department uh, when all of a sudden <laughs> uh, they showed me that they're still alive and well and they still have the guts that we used to have. Now, how did they do that? All throughout 2006 and 2007, George Bush and Dick Cheney were saying Iran is about to get a nuclear weapon and we've got to zap them, okay? Uh, in September of 2007, George Bush says, oh, so you want to let Iran get a nuclear weapon? You want World War III? Is that what you want? Okay. All the while, my friends were doing a bottom-up assessment of what we really knew about Iran's nuclear program. You know what they found out? Who knows what they found out? Yeah, please. They ended their nuclear weapons um, exploratory program in 2002. In 2003. Two. Yeah. At the end of 2003, they stopped working on a nuclear weapon. And my gutsy colleagues said that in black and white. Now, those are confidential, or in this case, top secret estimates. So what happened next? Well, uh, Admiral Fallon, the head of CENTCOM, who famously told one of my colleagues and in veteran intelligence professionals for sanity, he said, we're not going to do Iran on my watch. <laughs> and Pat Lang, my friend, he says, uh, okay, if I, if, if, okay, if I pass that along? He says, yeah. So Pat told the Washington Post, it got a lot of play, and Fallon got fired. Okay. Now, Mike Mullen came in about that time, and here's a pretty honest naval officer who knows what a conflict with Iran would look like, okay? <coughs> who had been in Vietnam, who, who knew something about this blood that gets shed during wars, okay? And Mike Mullen and uh, a few others in Congress uh, went to the president and said, now, Mr. President, this is quite a departure from what we've been saying about Iran. Uh, it's, it's bound to leak. <laughs> so we think you ought to sanitize the key judgments here and get them out before it leaks. <laughs> very, very clever. And so Bush had no alternative. It was going to leak from Congress for sure. And it, to the great relief of Admiral Mullen and everybody else who, who knew what it would mean to have a war with Iran. We're there now again. Uh, we'll get to that later. But that's, that was an honest estimate. It makes me incredibly proud of my former colleagues because they put new management in after Tenet and McLaughlin went, went, went off. And, uh, and now they're still doing an honest job, even on Iran, where there were incredible pressures for them to change their line and to say that Iran is working on a nuclear weapon. Well, let's get back to uh, what, what the CIA was doing on behalf of the United States government because what ended up happening in 1947 was against Truman's wishes, and he said this before he died. Right. He said this, okay? Uh, these operators were tacked on to the analysis part of the CIA, began to dominate it, okay? Why? Because they got all the money, you know? So what were they, what were they to do? Well, they, to, they were to enforce U.S. policy. Now, what was U.S. policy? post World War II. George Kennan, who was one of my idols, you know, Russian expert and all, and I, I learned a lot from him, 
I didn't know, and I never learned in college or graduate school, what his first paper as chair of the policy planning staff of the State Department, what his first paper said. And it was 1948, and I'll bet one or two of you know what it said. Well, actually, it was a little worse than that. I mean, containment made a lot of sense because the Soviets were a real threat. But what we said was this. <coughs> Although we in the United States dominate 50% of the world's natural resources, we only represent about 6% of the world's population. Therefore, our policy has to be crafted to maintain this disequilibrium. And we can't be diverted by things like civil liberties or soft things like justice for everyone. The time will come when we'll have to exert hard power." End quote. Wow! You know? And that's where we are today. We have a disproportionate amount of the world's natural resources and we're damn hell-bent hell and determined to be in control of as much of it as we can. We're, it's slipping, and it's going to slip more, and the empire is about to slip away, okay? But they're still, still hard at it. Now, what was the first, you know, we're talking about CIA for just another minute. Or what was the first thing that the CIA did to enforce this policy? Well, it was the junior partner, okay? It was starting to learn how to overthrow governments and so forth, and the British were our tutors. Now, there came a fellow into Iran named Mossadegh, freely elected prime minister, and, uh, you know, he, he was thinking about it, and he said, you know, the British, BP, it was BP's predecessor, BP is making a killing on the oil underneath our sands. You know, maybe, I think maybe the Iranian people should be able to profit a little from, from this. And he moved to nationalize the British oil concerns there. Now, that was a no-no. You know, that was a no-no since the British converted their <laughs> fleet from coal to, to oil. Oil was a precious natural, natural resource. It was going to run out after a century or so, but they needed it then. And so the British uh, MI6 took the young CIA nicks under their... Kermit Roosevelt and you know, other folks and said, now, you know, we're, this guy, Mossadegh, he's got to go. I mean, we got to make an object lesson about him. You don't nationalize Western oil facilities. And so you know the rest of the story. They did a coup in 1953. They got rid of Mossadegh. And thereon hangs a long, long tale of Iran's experience with the United States and Britain. Okay, it starts then. And even, even uh, President Obama had the guts to mention that in that famous speech he did in Cairo early on in his, uh, in his r regime. Okay, uh, the next thing and maybe the last thing I'll mention is the Bay of Pigs. Now you want to talk rogue? <laughs> that was rogue, man. As you know, uh, the, uh, the brain power, a lot of it came from the Ivy League folks, you know, the Yale, the Yaleys and the Harvards. Well, what I'm saying is the Harvards and the Yales were running stuff back then. And you know what? They're still running stuff in our country, as you know, okay? Now, I'm a little prejudiced. Uh, we Fordhams, uh, uh, you know, we're always told we're just as good as the, Fordham, as the Harvards and the Yales. But when they told us that 78 times, then we began to suspect, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe our prospects were not quite a, as good after all. So anyhow, they decided they were going to overthrow Castro because of what a terrible menace he was, right? <laughs> terrible menace. And so they did this Bay of Pigs thing, and they sold it to Eisenhower. And when JFK came in, he looked at it, and Bobby Kennedy looked at it and said, God, how are they going to, how are they going to take over Cuba with, you know, a couple of hundred, a couple of thousand uh, refugees? <coughs> uh, but the political pressures, once again, you know, how would it look if JFK came in, the first thing he did was cancel covert action program against communism in Cuba, okay? So he said, all right, you guys can go ahead, but look, if you expect the U.S. Air Force or you expect the U.S. Army to come and bail you out if this doesn't work, forget it. It's not going to happen. Guess what? <laughs> Alan Dulles and the rest of them smiled and said, this young guy doesn't know diddly, does he? <laughs> We're not going to be able to make it on the beaches, but there'll, there'll be no alternative but 
but uh, Kennedy will have to come in and, 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 and rescue us. We'll have a war with Cuba and we'll win. Okay? That was their calculation. How do I know that? <laughs> I know that from the coffee-stained notes that were uncovered in Alan Dulles's boudoir after he died. He says it, okay? Now, when Kennedy stuck to his guns and said, look, I told you guys you're not going to get any air power, you're not going to, then there was the buckle. And what did Kennedy say about the CIA? I'm going to split it in a thousand pieces. Exactly. I'm going, to I'm going to split it in a thousand pieces and throw it to the, disperse it to the winds, okay? And he did. He cashiered Alan Dulles. Now, you want to check the audio. Okay. Well, first, when I came down to the Army, I, I was I graduated with a bachelor's in Russian in 61, and uh, the Army let me uh, get my master's a year later before they called me in active duty. So it was November 3rd, 1962, when I was called active duty down at Fort Benning. Uh, the, the Army insisted I go through infantry officers' training as well as intelligence officers' training. And so there I was, uh, and we were down there in the, this place where they had these fantastic new weapons called grenade launchers. Oh man, they were really neat, except what? There weren't any there. There were no gr grenade launchers to train with. There were very few M1s, very few M14s. Guess where they all were? Key West. Key West, that's how close we were, folks, okay? But Kennedy said no. Now. What happened? Well, as I entered the agency early in 63 and went through their officer training there, we were subjected to lots of lectures. And one was by a fellow who was just incredibly irate and incredibly accusatory of the, the reigning president, John Kennedy. He ranted and raved about Kennedy chickening out on Cuba. And I think it was E. Howard Hunt. Okay. <laughs> I, I did, you know, I took notes, but you know, they're all classified. But I think it was E. Howard Hunt, and that's. Did they hate Kennedy? They hated him, as we say in New York. They hated him yet from another picture, <laughs> like the Iroquois Indians hated Gene Autry, right? Okay. So they hated him yet from another picture, and what did they do? They did him in. Now, you're probably surprised to hear me say that. I'm surprised to hear me say that, but you know what? There's a great book out called JFK and the Unspeakable. James Douglas wrote it. Uh, it's the best thing out. It takes advantage of all the things before and the, the special things that have been released by, by Act of Congress. And he makes a very persuasive case that it was Alan Dulles who, what did he end up doing? He ended up running the Warren Commission. <laughs> Hello? He was the one that booklets there that are little nuts to take off presidents. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so Alan Dulles, the guy who, you know, had, had, you could say he had it in for Kennedy, he ran the, the White Warren Commission and resorted to all kinds of skullduggery to keep people off, uh, keep people from testifying. And he, here's a little vignette that you probably don't know. In the Truman Library, <coughs> uh, there are documents showing that just as the commission got underway, and Harry Truman had written this editorial, an op-ed in the Washington Post saying, what has become of the CIA I wanted to create? I didn't expect it to be cloak and dagger overthrowing governments, assassinating people, like Castro and like... Now he wrote that op-ed exactly one month after John Kennedy was assassinated, okay? So, Alan Dulles <laughs> smelled trouble, right? <laughs> So he, he conjured up this speaking engagement in Kansas City and let the president, President Truman, uh, know that he's going to be in the area, right? And he'd like to drop in. So they arranged uh, that he could talk with uh, Harry Truman in the Truman Library, and nobody else was allowed to be there. Now we know from, <laughs> from the Truman Library now and from a memo that uh, Alan Dulles dictated in the wake of this that what he tried to do is to get Harry Truman to recant, to say, no, 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 that's, that's exactly what I intended. They're not rogue. Uh, they're, they're doing exactly what I wanted. And, and what does Dulles do? He claims that Harry Truman did do that. So he writes this memo to one of his henchmen, Larry Houston, who is the 
con uh, general counsel of the CIA forever, like from the beginning you know, until about till I retired. Okay, uh, and he says Harry Truman has recanted that. Uh, you know, he d he doesn't really think that uh, what he said w was true and so forth. You know, well. How do we know that's not true? Well, because the following month, Look Magazine had an article where Harry Truman is saying the same things he said in that op-ed, okay? So, I mean, that's just one little piece in, piece in, the, in the wind here, but the, the whole thing was terribly corrupt. What you don't do, what, what you don't, whoa! <coughs> uh, what you don't do is mess around with the established in, in Washington, okay? Uh, super establishment, Alan Dulles, his brother, John Foster Dulles. You don't mess around with those people, or else, or else, you know? And so, so that's, you know, that was really rogue, okay? Um, uh, what else is rogue? Well, you know, the rest of it, uh, there c can be other things shown to be rogue, but, but by and large, the CIA has not done anything that the president has, told, has not told them to do. So when 9-11 happened, some of you may have read uh, some of the books about this, but uh, I think it was uh, Richard Clark that pointed out that very evening after the president uh, addressed, the, uh, uh, addressed the nation, they went down into the bunker in the White House. The president had never been there before. And they got uh, Rumsfeld and uh, uh, George Tenet, head of the CIA. Uh, Richard Clark was there and others, okay, about five or six. And Clark says that uh, someone mentioned that uh, when the, the talk began, well, let's get Iraq now, you know, <laughs> uh, Rumsfeld, of all people, said, well, you know, it's, if you can't prove a connection with Iraq, then, you know, it, it, wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be legal. And Clark quotes the president as saying, I don't give a damn what the international lawyers say, we're gonna kick some ass, okay? Fast forward a couple of years, I'm in Crawford, <coughs> Texas, not invited there, but as part of Cindy Sheehan's, Sheehan's uh, witness there, and I see this great big placard held by one of the counter demonstrators, and it says, kick their ass and take their gas. Eloquent, <laughs> eloquent. That's uh, largely what it was all about, okay? So, what the president says, we're gonna kick some ass. And then, I wasn't there in the White House anymore, but I can just, uh, what, what happened is very clear. He called George Tenet in and he says, look, we're gonna give these guys the business, all right? Uh, you got any people that can use, you know, enhanced interrogation techniques? <laughs> and Tenet says, no. Why? Because we didn't. The closest we came were security investigations using the lie detector and so forth. The security folks, we didn't have any inter interrogators, that wasn't our job. But Tenet, true to his, pen, his bent, said, we don't have any, but we can get some. We got all these con contacts. We have some folks who were active in Viet Vietnam. Show, we, we can do it, sir, whatever you want. Yeah, we can do it. And you know the rest of the story, okay? You know the rest of the story. And jo uh, George Tenet and John McLaughlin, to their, well, you know, words, words fail me, okay? They went along with that kind of stuff. And there you have not a rogue operation, but a, uh, an ability for the President of the United States to use intelligence any way he damn well pleases. The only check on it is what? Us. Who? What? Well, the media is uh, defunct, right? Well, who's supposed to be the check on it? Congress. 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 Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, they you know, they used to have these oversight committees, you know? Yep. Now we call them the overlook committees. <laughs> <laughs> Wave that by the overlook committees. <laughs> yes, sir. <coughs> okay. So, getting back and winding this segment up, getting back to, uh, uh, to the business about how these two things, the operations, torture, and so forth, got uh, wo woven into what President Truman intended. Uh, there's one phrase in the National Security Act of 1947 which says, the Director of, Cent of Central Intelligence shall perform such other functions and duties as the President of the United States shall from time to time direct. Okay, 
Now that doesn't mean th that they're allowed to do illegal things, but they do. You know, if the president directs them to do it, then they feel well. You know, that's what the law says. So, so that kind of winds up this business about rogue. Most of the stuff, except for the Bay of Pigs, you know, that was really rogue. We know that. The rest of the stuff is all by presidential order for the most part. There are some exceptions there, including the worst, including uh, the kidnapping, including the, the, the black prisons where, where people were put without uh, any word to their wives or their children, much less the Red Cross, uh, including the torture, the torture. Now, I'm sort of running out of time here, and I wanted to uh, get into something quite different how many folks here have a direct blood relative serving in Afghanistan or Iraq? Three, four, five, okay. <laughs> now when I asked that question in the suburbs of Washington, guess how many hands go up? None. And then when I, at a Kiwanis thing recently, I asked, well, how many know of somebody, you know, just know somebody? No hands, okay? And then I give a little, <laughs> little uh, sermon at a, a black church in Greensboro, North Carolina. And guess how many hands go up, folks? Half of them, half of them for the first one. Almost all of them for the second one. That's not right. That's not justice. You know, a lot of us come, come out, out of the Judeo-Christian tradition where we had prophets around who would call our attention to those things, right? I mean. One of my favorites is Isaiah, you know? Now, the word is that Isaiah went around for two years stark naked, stripped of his garments. And, you know, the, some of the exegetes uh, say in their pedantic way, well, it, uh, it, it wasn't, it's not clear that he was always naked just during liturgical services. <laughs> well, you know, it doesn't, doesn't let the man off the hook. What was he saying, folks? What was he saying? He said, look, I, I strip myself of my garments, okay? You, you say that's terrible, but you are stripped. You are stripped of the vision, the vision of shalom and justice with which Yahweh blessed you, and that is much more reprehensible. We can't let, let ourselves be stripped of that vision. I, I teach a course uh, at the Servant Leadership School in, in the inner city of Washington, and I get a lot of interns and a lot of people from the neighborhood, and it, it's, uh, the title is uh, Biblical Justice, Is It an Un-American Activity? <laughs> <laughs> and you know what, folks? It is. You know? I mean, here's, here's the American concept of justice, right? Blindfolded lady. And why is she blindfolded? Right, so she can't show any bias or prejudice one way or the other. What's, what's the biblical concept of justice? Biased and prejudiced to the poor in favor of the unawing, the dispossessed, the hated poor, okay? And that's, that's the tradition from which many of us come. The very word for justice pre-Aramaic in the Hebrew Bible is tzedakah, which denotes, not connotes, but denotes showing mercy to the poor. Now you look at that thing, and you look around us, and you see the injustices in our society. It's up to us. We're not too, too far gone to address these things. And I think that uh, what I try to do, um, I, I find that from my experience and from some people who think that since I worked for the CIA for 27 years, I might know something, well, that's a captive audience, okay? So what I try to do is what Martin Luther King recommends in his, uh, in his letter from the Birmingham City Jail. He, he compared the, the task to a boil. He said, so he said, like a boil that can never be cured so long as it's covered up, but must be opened with all its pus flowing ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light, so too injustice must be uncovered with all the tension that its uncovering creates to the air of national opinion and the light of human conscience before it can be cured. So that's, 
that's what I think we all need to be about, be get, get enough information to, to do this. And what I see other folks of our age doing, I mean, I, I gave a talk to the Raging Grannies up there in New York. Man, what a group, what a witness, you know? And uh, I happened to ask, I said, it's not the first time I asked, I said, well, where are the Raging Grandpas? Where are the raging grandpas? So, okay. So, so let's think about that. Uh, and before I, I just want to say one other thing. Let's see. Uh, yeah, um, I, I found in talking around and hearing questions that there's a typical, maybe it's not unique to Americans, but there's a typical American reluctance to embark on any significant course of action if there is a decent chance we might fail, <coughs> that we might not have success, that we might even be left at. You know? um, success. Victor Hugo in Les Miserables says this about success. Success, he says, is an ugly thing. Why? Because men are deceived by its false resemblances to merit. Okay. Now, I think we all agree that the good is worth doing because it is good, right? And the consequences often are not in our hands. And I was so edified to learn about your 104-year-old neighbor, recently deceased, who at 102 was standing out there on that corner holding the big sign against the wall. That's where we're at. Yeah. That same man had read the 26 volumes of the Warren Commission. Ah. Shop and all that. Okay, so he, he was well educated on all the ins and outs of what's going on. So, so I think what we need to do is kind of say, all right, you know, wh what do we do? Wh what, what is it up to us? Uh, and I, I'll finish here with my remarks here by just, just citing something I wrote for the Veterans for Peace uh, uh, newsletter. Actually, it's a fundraiser. We veterans demand to know, is it right to fire teachers, police and firefighters, close libraries, <laughs> leave students in permanent debt, gut medical and social security benefits by pretending there is not enough money? My God, we have to tell our co-citizens, there's plenty of money. 50% of what we pay in taxes, more than 50% goes to the war machine. It's very simple. People are profiting, profiteering, big time, on these wars. Yeah. Take that money and put it where it should be go. It should go. Uh, Rabbi Abraham Heschel, who is a real favorite of mine, he had words for this. He addressed the agony of the plundered poor. Heschel said that wherever injustice takes place, few are guilty but all are responsible. Yeah. Adding that indifference to evil is more insidious than doing evil itself. And Martin King got more particular, and this is the last quote. Quote, it should be incandescently clear that no one who has any concern for integrity in America today can ignore the present war. If America's soul becomes totally poisoned, part of the autopsy must read Vietnam, or Iraq, or Afghanistan, or God help us, Iran. So we need to do something about this, folks. Uh, we can't be kind of wondering, you know, it's beyond our power to do it. Uh, I think that uh, this is a crucible. This is the time where the issue is joined. And the good news, of course, as I see it, is the uh, Occupy movement, where, where people are, are really, really seizing power. And, uh, and the last thing I'll say is that uh, the best evidence of the power of the people here in the Occupy movement is the, the incredibly fascist law that our president signed late on New Year's Eve where we were all reveling, okay? It's called the National Defense Authorization Act, and it empowers anyone here. Hopefully, the fellows from the from the field station in Miami has left. 
But he is empowered to pick me up, take me to Guantanamo, where you'll never hear from me again. And all of you are similarly liable. It's incredible, okay? Now, why did they do that? Fear. Fear. Fear of whom? Us. us. They're afraid of us. They're afraid of what happens if they start a war with Iran and the lid blows off. What are we going to do? What are the Occupy movements going to do? We're going to cause problems, okay? So what do they need? Well, they've already seen police departments who have been persuaded they're part of the 99%. The police in Albany, they wouldn't arrest them. They wouldn't do what the, what the authorities told them, okay? And so they're afraid. They're afraid if, if we convene, as we will, this spring in Washington and surround the White House and surround the Congress, how are they going to get home to their Georgetown uh, places for the martinis, okay? They're afraid. Oh, they're calling the Capitol Police part of the 99 percent. Well, they're calling Secret Service. Well, there aren't enough of them. Uh, the the D DC police, part of the 99 percent. So what do they need? What do they need? What's the most trustworthy organ that they can use? The Army. The Army. And that's what that law says. They can use the Army now to wrap us all up. So things are pretty labile, as the Germans say. Things are pretty tense. And you know, this is our, our time to st step up to the plate and use whatever talents, experience, whatever gifts that we have to make sure that our children and our grandchildren are granted the, the same shot at life that we've had. And I'll stop there and answer this question. Now, I don't know what the procedure here is, but I have a whole bunch of questions already here. And then there are hands going up. To whom should I show preference? The cards first. The cards. Written questions first. And Written questions first. Okay. All right. This is in this is in no no particular order. Ah. How do you keep from getting unbearably depressed? <laughs> should we be moving to a different country? You know, this is a really good. This is a really good question. I mean, it is awfully depressing. You know, and uh, were I not to be part of a, a, actually in my case, it's a church community. It's an ecumenical church community, very active in social outreach in inner city Washington, and we sort of bear bear one another up. I'm sort of the outlier. They insist that I identify myself with this church. You know why? The pastor says, if they come for you, they're going to have to come from all of us for all of us. Wow. So that's the kind of support I enjoy, okay? Now, I suggest that, you know, if you're not in that kind of a supportive group, uh, then, you know, find one. Because you can't do this stuff alone. Because you know what? Otherwise you get depressed. Uh, let's see. No, I wouldn't move to a different country yet. <laughs> Is the Obama administration continuing these abuses? You know, I hate to be in a position of saying yes, but yes in spades. Even George W. Bush, bless his heart, didn't claim explicitly to be able to target U.S. citizens for assassination. I, I'm sorry? Yeah, no, no, yeah, I'm talking about... Oh, the, uh, yeah, the question is uh, whether the... Um, the National Defense Authorization Act passed or signed on New Year's Eve by the president, whether it really means the things that I said it means, and it does. Yeah. The, it authorizes the military to detain you without charge or trial until the end of the war on terror. A anybody know when the last terrorists are going to be wiped off the face of the earth? That, that's how bad it is, yeah. So yeah, the Obama administration is as bad as the, the Bush, but it's worse in the sense that there are so many liberals, L-I-B-R-U-L-S, who still think that Obama can't be criticized because, ooh, who else would you get, you know? Well, you know, I'm not expert in domestic politics, and I recognize that this is a very difficult kind of situation. But the notion that we can't hold this guy accountable when he has said, hold me accountable, make me do it, my God! We're better than that. 
We need to do precisely that. Uh, can you contribute your thoughts and knowledge about the Downing Street memo, which of course deserves much more attention than it has been given, and why, if the memo has a factual basis, President Bush wasn't held accountable? He wasn't held accountable because John Conyers has no guts. You, you think about the people who are responsible for all this stuff, you know? One person never mentioned is Joe Biden. What was his position before the war in Iraq? Anybody remember? He was chair of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate. So when we needed a Bill Fulbright, we got a Joe Biden. None of my friends. Scott Ritter, who knew in and out what was going on right. with the inspections, none could get past the door to testify before Biden's committee. So there's one guy. Now, who is the fellow I was just mentioning? And, you know, John Conyers, yeah. You know, I, the only time I was actually convicted for an arrest was uh, standing in John Conyers' office and saying, look, uh, uh, Congressman, you, have, you swore the same oath that I did as an Army officer to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States from all enemies, foreign and domestic. You're head of the Judiciary Committee in the House. The Constitution says that you must impeach a reigning president for impeachable offenses. If you don't have a list of impeachable offenses by now, you do. Why don't you impeach this person? Oh, well, uh, oh. He, he all but said explicitly, uh, that's off the table because we want to win big in November, and uh, if we look divisive, we might not win so big in November. Well, they did win big in November. And what the hell happened? Nothing. Okay? So that was Nancy Pelosi and John Conyers. Now, all these guys, you know, they don't hold people accountable. It's all a big club. And that's why the, you know, the Occupy movement is really the only, it's the system. It's a, my friend, my friend, my idol, Dorothy Day, who set up the Catholic Worker. She had it right. Anybody remember what she said? It's the filthy, rotten system <laughs> that puts people in poverty, that, that uh, gives uh, uh, money to war profiteers. So Downing Street memo, very simple. This was an incredible, incredible revelation. It was leaked uh, in Britain. And it was documentary. It was the memo. And what did it say? It said that um, Sir Richard Dearlove, the head of the British CIA, MI6, was in Washington touching base with George Tenet, the head of the CIA, on Saturday, the 20th of July, 2002. He went over there because Tony Blair wanted to know really what Bush was thinking. You know, telephone is fine, but eye to eye, you need, and who would know better than George Tennant, who saw Bush every morning, six mornings a week. So Dear Love goes to Tennant and he says, what's going on? Well, Tennant gives him the, the, the real scoop. He goes back and he tells Tony Blair and the 12 disciples there, or the 12 apostles, or the, the, his, his 12 cabinet people, uh, he tells them this, George Bush has decided on war against Iraq for regime change. The war will be justified by the conjunction of weapons of mass destruction and terrorism. And the facts are being fixed around the intelligence. Is that a quote? That's exact quote. The facts are being fixed? Yes. That's the exact quote, yeah. And are, you t are you telling the audience that the Congress, the leadership of the Congress knew this and still refused to impeach? They, they Congress was, uh, was persuaded, uh, Conyers was persuaded to hold a hearing on this. Yeah. I testified at that hearing. You could see it on, on C-SPAN. And what happened at the hearing? Well, I testified that uh, this, this, this was real, this was documentary, and then, you know, after we, this was sort of, a year after everybody had realized what was going on, okay? So the Washington Post said, well, this is nothing new. Well, nothing new, for God's sake, this is documentary. 
The British have not disavowed it. Uh, Fox News, you'll be amused at this perhaps, they said, oh, well, uh, fixed, fixed. The intelligence and facts are being fixed around the policy. That was the exact quote. The intelligence and facts were being fixed around the policy. Well, <laughs> you have to realize that the, the fixed has a quite different connotation in British usage. <laughs> so I call up my friend in London, Harry, Harry, uh, you got a second? Yeah, Ray, what, what's going on? I, ju I just wanted one question. W what does fixed mean uh, in, in Britain, you know? What do you, he said, Ray, you lost it? What's going on? I said, look, just tell me, what does, when you say you fix something, what does it mean in British? He says, well, you fix a horse race? Uh, you fix an election? Uh, well, thanks very much. Boom. <laughs> fixed is fixed. <laughs> and they still wouldn't, you know. So, so when I, I told Conyers, I said, you have to, <laughs> I told Conyers, it was Cindy Sheehan, myself, and, and somebody else. And I said, you know, you really need to, he says, well, no, no, you're not going to. I said, well, I'm not leaving here until you decide to beat you. Yeah. Well, he called the Capitol Police. They put, put me in jail. And <laughs> this time I decided that, uh, you know, I'd go to trial. <laughs> but that didn't, you know, didn't get me off. I was convicted, so I don't know if I can go to Canada now or whatever. But we we'll take, uh, we, we take me to Canada. Good. All right. So that's enough about me. Hasn't the CIA always been a snake pit? Didn't Bush and Cheney throw George Tenet under the bus? If so, why? Well, uh, as I tried to say, there are basically two CIA's. And the part, really, two, two separate entities. They were joined in that structural fault that I mentioned. And I didn't work in a snake pit. For 27 years, I was, well, toward the end, it sort of got a little corrupted, but I was able to, to tell, as I did, uh, the president, vice president, secretary of state, secretary of defense, in the early 80s, exactly what we thought. And when Bill Casey, and Bob Gates started to adulterate the intelligence and say there were three Soviets under every rock in Nicaragua, I would forget to tell those people that because I knew they wouldn't believe it. So um, <coughs> what I'm saying here is that, yeah, uh, there's one part of the CIA that was created to do the president's bidding. There used to be some oversight, there isn't any more, and so, yeah, they're running drones, they're putting people in black holes, they're torturing people. I don't know if it still goes on to the degree it did before, but our president has not closed Guantanamo, and I think that's a, a national disgrace that things still exist. Okay, should I do one or two? Or you got to do it now. Okay. Okay, this Sorry, is it. This is the hook. Sorry, after we have to finish it up now. We'll invite this gentleman back again so he can continue yes. or give us some new information in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.